yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to sh the Shift Conference. So today I'm going to talk about standardized uh, develop environments and generally issues with um, dev environments. And sort of to start off with who I am and what, why I'm here. So you got a bit of intro. So I actually did found the Shift Conference, which started in Europe, and now it's this huge, large um, three, 4,000 person event. Um, Miami is the foray outside of Europe, and I'm happy to be here, and I'm glad that we're doing this in Miami. Um, very much like the city. I uh, enjoy it quite a bit, and so I'm glad to see that the team is pulling through. Uh, before uh, Daytona and before Shift, uh, the co-founding team of Daytona also co-founded a company called Code Anywhere. And so Code Anywhere started in 2009, so some of you are pretty young um, to remember that. Uh, but in 2009, we started Code Anywhere, which was the very first cloud IDE. As part of the cloud ID, basically a browser-based text editor, there was also an element to spinning up dev environments in the, in the back end. And so it was a bit early for its time, and so Daytona is our sort of second foray uh, into that. Let's see if this works. It works. Awesome. Great. So what are standardized development environments? The, the names are all over the place. Um, so I didn't find an actual definition, so I wrote one on my own, which I will dis distill still a bit. So basically, a standardized development environment, and reading this right off the board here, provides a consistent workspace, configuration tools, build process, and environment settings, enabling a uniform development setting, ensuring that every developer operates with the same parameters. Basically meaning that every developer can get up and running instantaneously um, as any other one on the team working on the same project. And so the idea basically is that you decide to code and that you start coding. But the issue with that is I feel like for software development, we're basically in the 1900s where we were with cars. And so by the way, um, I like cars quite a bit, and you'll get analogy, uh, uh, analogies from them uh, through this. Um, so sorry about that. Um, anyway, in the 1900s, uh, to start a car, you actually had to crank. You had to put it in the engine. You had to crank it up. You had to have levers inside. It was sort of like a task to get it up and running. Versus today, especially with the EVs, it's basically you sit in, hit a button, and you just go. And if you have a Tesla, it probably drives itself there as well. So you don't have to do anything. It just like gets you there. And so with software development, we're still very, very, very uh, far behind. And so we, solving the problem of dev environments, we wanted to figure out what are the constraints you have to think about to get that sort of one button EV sort of car um, future where you can just start coding. And so the constraints are that it has to, the productivity, which is it has to instantaneously spin up always. It has to be scalable, meaning that if you're a software developer and you don't have enough space on your laptop, that you can sort of expand it to a remote cloud and it works the same. And the last, maybe not super interesting for all you, you all here, but security, if you're working for a large um, enterprise, they're very, very particular about where their source code, is, source code is based. So thinking about these three pillars, how do we create something that always just works? And so starting off with productivity. Um, button, button. No, I missed two slides, didn't I? No, I didn't. I'm good. Um, productivity. So 56% of developers' productive time is lost on doing things in and around the dev environment. And so this is not a made-up number, a uh, bit of research here. We found two sources. We did our own research. So when you remove your non-working weeks, your overhead tasks like email, meetings, whatever, you spend another 2.7 hours on dev environments, waiting for tests, waiting for builds, and basically you throw away just a bunch of time. Um, and the way we're setting up these developed environments right now is basically, one, you're reading through large readmes, which are probably not up to date always. You have a bunch of scripts to automate the installation. And probably the last thing, you do a lot of head banging because the two above didn't work. So you have to go out and solve it yourself. Um, just a caveat on there, there is something called dev environment as code, um, which is helping a large portion of this. And this is some, not something that we do. Um, we embrace it at Daytona, and hopefully um, you should all take a look at it as well. So dev environment as code is a, just like infrastructure as code for, that's existed in the DevOps world for quite a long time, um, is now being sort of taken into the dev environment. There's a few standards out there, dev container, Nix, dev file. There's a new one called Flux. Uh, basically, it's just one file um, that is usually like a YAML uh, or a JSON, which defines everything that you need 
uh, for your development environment to get up and running. So it is a section of your README file um, that, a, that your editor can read and sort of install uh, up for you. Uh, Dev Container is from Microsoft, and it's integrated right away with GitHub and Codespaces. So definitely, if you're checking them out, do look at this one first. This solves a part of a problem, but not the entire one. Um, and so moving on to scalability, um, I have a lag on this. Anyway, devs love it was an accident, and they decided to leave it here. It's an error, basically, that you don't have enough space on your machine. And so sometimes these new Macs are pretty powerful. You can run a lot of things. But even then, sometimes when you're running, you just barely run the dev environment. I had a call with a colleague a couple two months ago, three months ago, we're on a Zoom call and his video didn't work essentially because the dev environment was taking up too much space. And this is like a common problem. And even if that is not the problem, if you want to like check out code from someone else and help them out, you have to shut down your development environment to spin up another one. So um, what do you do when you don't have enough space or just barely enough space? I'm waiting for my clicker, which is not working. Um, the way most people do it now is basically spin it up on an EC2 instance, a DigitalOcean droplet, or wherever, whatever they might have available, which just throws in a bunch of other problems. So now you're not just working on your local machine, you're setting it up. You also have to have credentials to uh, AWS. You have to make sure the server's the right size. You have to kill the server when you're done with it. There's like a bunch of overhead that you have to do or your DevOps team has to do. Um, and actually, uh, looking at JetBrains uh, released their they do it once a year, their developer report. And over the last two years, 50% of developers have actually said that they've worked remotely for some reason or the other. So be it the size of the machine, uh, needing specific, uh, specific uh, uh, tooling or GPUs or whatever it might be, but also, which we'll get at the end, for security reasons, because you know, the company make, has to make sure that it's running in, e in the EU or in the US or whatnot. Um, and so, we now have a situation where we have developers that are working locally and they're working remotely, and neither of them work. Both of them are complicated, and they're both very, very different. Um, one inspiration to what we're building and this problem of local, remote, and all these developed environments is actually Shopify. So uh, Don Kelly, pro product engineering manager at Shopify, actually runs their internal developer environment product, I forgot what they call it internally. Um, this is the reason why they actually created something for remote as well. But the interesting thing for them, and specifically them, is every engineer in Shopify has one as a CLI tool that has a single command that has a flag for cloud or for local. So every developer there can decide where they want to run their dev environment, um, and it's the same experience on both. And so it's essentially like having multiple laptops with the same interface working um, exactly the same. The last part, um, which we'll get into a bit, is security and why security is important to enterprises. I'm just going to get a bit of water. Um, apologies. I like this story from Uber. Um, Uber was charged um, fine by the FTC for secure non-production software environments, basically dev environments. Um, short version of the story is there was a software engineer which had a local dev environment on their laptop. In their laptop was the source code. In the source code was the keys to the database. And they lost that laptop, and someone got access to the database. And so someone accessed the database. They took all the data of people in Uber. I was one of them. And if you were driving in 2018, you were one of them as well. Um, and they were fined. I'm going to just click with this. Um, they were fined $142 million for source code leakage. So the fine is pretty big. It's not just because they lost the source code. It's also because they didn't report that someone had access to it. But nonetheless, um, after doing this, they solved the problem by creating their own internal developer, uh, dev environment manager called DevPod. Essentially, now every engineer in Uber has um, a centralized place where they spin up and spin down these develop environments, super scalable instant and secure because Uber uh, owns where they're running. Um, and if you're not Uber or one of the tech companies that have built something like this, uh, how people are doing this right now um, in the world is something called remote desktop or terminal services. And so I'm just going to raise a hand. Have, and do you, any of you know what this is at all? Yeah. OK, quite a few. Awesome. Like, 
I've seen the younger generations, they have no idea what this is. So um, I'm glad that some of you do. Um, for those of you who don't, it's essentially um, like screen share. Uh, you're logged into a server, you have the desktop over there, and the way to, to code in these environments is that the editor and everything is running over there. So essentially you have to work on your machine and that machine over there. You can't copy and paste back and forth, you have to email things to yourself, and there's also this huge lag. It is literally hell to work eight hours a day in this thing. And this is how companies do this right now, because there's no other way without building something of your own. So sort of like circling back to what we're trying to achieve, the idea is not to have a 1900s car with a crank that I have to spin up, but rather just click and start coding. But the reality, again, is that you have to check out your code, you have to update your dev environment, down your libraries, install your tools, wait for builds, update dependencies, and all these things, and then you can start coding. Um, and this isn't just a one-time thing, like it works on every single project that you work on, if you're working in a company, on every team, on every project. And of course, this actually isn't a one-to-one -one image, I just wanted to show that it's like just an absolute horrendous mess. If you add the complexities of working both locally and remotely, it's just an awful experience for you um, altogether as a developer. And so, for me, this really doesn't make sense, literally, I say cars are here again. So we have, you have the Uber app, you press a button, you get a car waiting for you. You're hungry, pick Chipotle or whatever, you hit a button, it comes to you. So we can move things in the real world, but we can't install libraries automatically. That's very much beyond me, and this is 2024. And essentially, like, software engineers are the people making all these things. So um, we created a solution very much similar to what you think of as Uber, which is like, Select Uber is like, where am, I, where am I now? Where am I going? What car is going to pick me up? Come get me. So here's very similar. It's like, where is my project? Pick your source code repo where it is. Select your target. Where do you want this developed environment? Do you want it on your machine? Do you want it in the cloud, wherever you want? And pick the ID you want to use and just start coding. That's it. Everything else is very, um, more or less done, and you can focus on doing what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, the enterprise product has a GUI as well, so quite similar to this one. Um, I'll spin this up real quick, same thing. Um, I have templates and I have my Git repository. This one looks a bit more fancy. I can pick my ID and I can pick the size of machine or location. This one is running just on a cluster on GCP. And I will hit um, continue. Um, this one is running remotely, this one's not running on my local machine. So when it, what it's doing right now, it, it warming up means that it's going on, um, this one is on Google, on GCP, it's going up there, it's spinning up a machine for me. Um, once it spins up that machine, it is going to read through the repository. In the repository, if it finds a configuration file, it will execute against that configuration file. Um, if it does not, um, it will load a default base image um, that you as an admin can define. Um, after that, it will uh, create a VPN connection to my local uh, laptop, so I have access to all the ports. It will also con connect to my VS Code securely, so it will feel like it's running local, um, and it will add a reverse proxy to that as well. And so. This is still warming up, and demo is, is not good, doing very well for me today, which is hilarious. But yeah, hopefully I'll give it a minute to get up and running. On this cluster, no one has done anything for a while, um, so it might take a minute. The good thing is when you talk at a lot of conferences, you're no longer stressed when your demo doesn't work. Like, I would have died 10 years ago if this happened to me. Um, Mm. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, so the way the, the, you can set it up in configuration. The way it's set up right now is that if there's like 30 minutes idle time, it will just, it will um, put it to sleep. Um, releasing um, the, the resources, everything, it'll just save, you'll just have disk space that you use up. Um, and if it's not used for two weeks at all, then it actually deletes it. But 
as an admin, you can change these things, so it can, you know, it can be long living if you want. But the idea is that they are ephemeral. That you know, you ch you create a workspace every time you check out a repo, you do your work, you commit, and then you kill it and you spin it up uh, again. All right, so it actually did spin up. So thank you. Um, at least something. Um, so just going through the logs while it's happening. As I said, it cloned the repository. It found the, um, I'll cancel this one second. Um, it found a dev container which had a Docker Compose. It, it installed everything there and got everything up and running. Um, and we'll open my VS Code. So now I connected, it connected to my VS Code securely. It didn't ask me anything. This, of course, it asks because VS Code knows it's not running on my local machine. Um, and so I have a VS Code here running with all the files, source, con component, content. This is a, guys. Um, anyway, this project itself um, needs one command to get up and running outside of this. So it's this one right here. And even though this is running on Google's cloud, um, my machine What did I just do? I hear it. Uh, my machine thinks it's running on localhost. So it feels like it's running on my machine, but it actually isn't. Um, also, because it is running somewhere else, there is a reverse proxy. So I can um, share this with you all. Um, and you can access this. Let me get a QR code here, real quick. That's not the name. So if you scan this, you should probably open this project that I spun up um, right now. Sorry, I have to go back here. It should work. Does it work? Can anyone tell me does it work or not? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. We got it up and running. Great. So back to presentation-wise. So we got one demo running. Anyway, um, this whole experience, at least without the bugs and not um, happening, uh, we decided to make open source. Also, it is version 0 0.11, so there's still things to do. We launched it a month ago. Um, it's 100% open source. It is Apache 2.0, meaning you can do whatever the hell you want with it. Essentially, only the only thing that's needed is to make sure that, you know, that Daytona originally made it. Um, you can find that at github.com uh, slash Daytona IO slash Daytona. Uh, we would appreciate stars. I wouldn't be a founder if I didn't. So. Um, Another QR code, scan, follow, like, star. Um, we launched it, again, a little over a month ago. It's like 5,000 stars. So it actually does work. There are people that, that like it and use it. Um, there's a bunch of issues. So if you do run into issues like this, um, feel free to uh, open them up on GitHub. Um, and so is although the, the title of the uh, talk is Standardized Development Environments, is Daytona standard? It is not a standard. It is a development environment manager, meaning it is an automation tool. We take care of everything, when again, um, take care of everything that you need to get up and running without you having to think about it at all. And so again, what does, what does that mean? And what does Daytona do? When it's running remotely, it creates a VM. When it's running locally, it doesn't, hence the, the asterisk. Um, but creates a dev environment inside of that, clones a repo, executes configuration if there is, Securely connects and exchange keys with your ID, creates a VPN tunnel so you have access to all your ports. It proxies everything to localhost, adds a fully qualified domain name or reverse proxy um, so you can share with, with um, people that you work with. And all you need to do is basically uh, type in Daytona create. Um, yeah, I just want to touch, and I have a couple minutes left, on like the enterprises and why they use that. And you had a, a look at what the enterprise product does look at. Um, as I mentioned, companies like Shopify, Uber have made this, Airbnb, Plaid, Slack, Stripe, Eventbrite, in, Intuit, mostly all, mostly only tech companies. So everyone outside of the tech world has been left without such a solution. Um, and what's interesting is all these companies are, developers inside these companies, when they have a choice, 80% of people use it. When they don't, obviously 100%. But things like in, Uber, like their MPS score from internal developers went from minus 50 to plus eight, which is quite a bit. Um, and Airbnb was like, they announced that it was their most successful investment as of last year. 
bunch of numbers is why too increases you know um, developer satisfaction, reduces DevOps time, um, and so yeah, we are hopeful that Daytona Create will work for you, unlike what it did didn't for me right now, um, and that you no longer have to read through readmes and try to set up develop environments. And so with that, um, love to hear your comments, uh, love to hear any questions, and yeah, this is my email. Get me on Twitter, um, LinkedIn, anywhere, and always happy to chat. Thank you. Yeah, any questions or no questions? Well, I'll leave with that. Question. What do you think the advantage of Nix6Care right now? What would be like, what's the thing that makes them? Oh, so the, the, the well, Nix6Care takes care of the configuration itself that's running, but not necessarily the hardware underneath on which it's running as well. So we take care of all of that, and then with that hardware, does it connect to your editors or whatnot and adds all these other things to that. So it is a, we work very well, well, we will work fairly well with Nix as well, um, like Dev Container. There's a question behind you from. You mean like, uh, so licenses are not part of the service, it's an infrastructure service. So if you're using VS Code, it's 100% free. Um, anyway, if you're using JetBrains, it's the same license that you have with JetBrains as well. Yeah. Does it handle, uh, no, go ahead, go ahead. Does it handle, like, uh, stuff, just the dev environment part. So the, the idea is to get your dev environment as close as you can to your um, deployment environment, so it's as similar as possible. But from the dev environment, you go into the DevOps pipelines lifecycle as you would normally. Question? Oh yeah, you go to the GitHub repository. Um, there's an there's just one link to copy to get installed, and it runs right away. That's why I said start it, hopefully, and so yeah, now hopefully it'll start. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. So depending on what you're like, if you're an individual developer, this gives you the SaaS-like experience of code spaces for essentially either no money, so we charge nothing for it, so um, or you can run it on anything that you, else that you want. So code spaces one works only with GitHub.com. So if you work with on GitLab or Bitbucket, it doesn't connect. Code spaces also they have a free amount of hours, but after that they charge you a full whatever they're equal to EC2 instances, which is not cheap, um, and it only works remotely. So this open source project gives you that same feel of code spaces, essentially, but will also run on your machine or just on a droplet anywhere else. So it works with any provider. It works on more cost efficient clouds, and it also works locally. There was one question up there somewhere. What do you mean, example being? So yeah, you can add all that inside either your um, dev container configuration or in the Docker-based image that gets pulled into it. So either, those are the two ways you can get it in. Yeah, for now, it, you need to have Docker um, installed to get it up and running, yeah. Yeah? Oh yeah, the open source one specifically, you manage the, the environments yourself, you just connect it to the servers that you want it to, yeah. Yeah, so, go ahead. We just interact with it, yeah. So that's both for the open source single individual one, we interact with it, but also the enterprise well as well. You get like a installation for that and you run it on your own. Yes? 
Yep. Yeah, you put it as a base image and it spins that up by default for all the users. Cool, we're out of time. We had questions, awesome. Thank you, even though, thank you, appreciate it.